Hey, Mushroom Nerds, it's Anna McHugh. I'm doing one of my favorite things, which is hang out in a beach grove on a Saturday morning. I'm spending some time with some uh, chanterelle mushrooms in the Cantharellus genus. I believe this to be a provisionally named species called Cantharellus velutinus. And I'll talk about that and a couple of its different color forms. Um, you know, this is sort of an area of chanterelle research that is a little bit cryptic. It's very hard to make definitive identifications without uh, you know, microscopic study, but I can give you a good best estimate of a couple of the different things that you may see in uh, the forests of the southeastern U.S. when we're talking about some of these more specific categorizations and species of cantharellus. If you're a novice, however, um, you know, getting to know chanterelles and getting to know how to gather them is a pretty simple affair, and so even though we have some cryptic species going on, they all kind of take this similar form, and many of them this is actually what I would consider to be a classic chanterelle. So, uh, you know, it's kind of a orangey um, sort of egg yolk uh, color on the top, and you have very prominently uh, forked and wrinkly uh, gills, uh, well, false gills, on the underside. And you have some of them that uh, those gills look more gill-like. Here is a baby that, you know, you can see uh, those are, like, they're going to open up and be a little more forked. So, you know, within a reasonable margin of forked and wrinkly. I have other videos about that, but the long and short is if you're a novice learning to collect mushrooms in the Cantharellus genus, so chanterelles collectively, is a pretty easy thing to do. Um, and that's uh, wonderful because, you know, you can get into the academic aspect of it if you're so inclined, or you can just collect, you know, five different species of chanterelles in the same patch and just be like, they look a little bit different and that's really enjoyable on my pizza. Um, anyway, I kind of fall in the middle of those two uh, paths and so I've been trying to read up on my chanterelles a little bit more. Uh, but before I get into that, I wanted to talk, you know, really quickly about habitats and also guidelines and regulations of where you are allowed to go mushroom hunting. This is sort of generic advice uh, that will get you pointed in the right direction. I am neither an attorney nor a forest products resource management specialist. Uh, I just, you know, by way of trying to be helpful, uh, want to point out like what my habits are when I'm coming to a new town and I breeze into town and I want to hunt mushrooms, you know, what are the kind of information that I'm going to be looking for. All right, so let's start, however, with beach groves because this is one of the places where I find lots of the most interesting mushrooms in our forest. So beech is a hardwood tree, and unlike, it's a really easy tree to identify because, you know, you have oak trees and um, poplar trees and all kinds of things that have rough, scaly bark. But beech, on the other hand, is very smooth and this sort of attractive light gray. I'm going to get a larger piece here uh, that shows sort of this um, mottled uh, appearance. So you have a lot of like light gray and darker gray. And as the uh, trees get big, I don't have one in the background, but like they almost look elephantine. So, you know, they can be really gnarled and I'm trying to find a larger stick next to me. I should have been better prepared. Uh, but, you know, they're these um, really beautiful broadleaf trees with smooth gray bark and they produce a lot of really good mushrooms. Uh, they also are very distinctive because they have a quite simple leaf. And so, you know, it doesn't have lobes. It's just sort of this like bloop, that's uh, a beech leaf and it has these uh, sort of veins that are really straight. It's very straightforward and they're very thin. Now, the other thing that I will note about beech groves is that um, they often stink and I don't know what it is. I think it might be something called uh, flux. Uh, or acid flux. I don't know anything about plant pathogens either, but you know, sometimes I'll sit down in one of these groves and I'm examining my chanterelles and I'm having a great time and I just get this overwhelming aroma of like poop. And so uh, I'm not exactly sure what that's all about, but I'm pretty confident I, you know, I don't see any wildlife scat nearby. Uh, so there's a lot of microbial activity happening in beech groves and they're, you know, wonderful and shady. Um, but oftentimes I'm like, sometimes beech trees smell quite like feces. And I'm trying to get to the bottom of that. Anyway, I will spare you the details. Let's talk about 
uh, where you can hunt for mushrooms. And um, I'm going to speak from the perspective of, uh, you know, a hobbyist. So I collect mushrooms to eat kind of uh, based on like what I can reasonably store or consume within three days. And so that's typically like definitely less than five pounds for me usually. So I like to eat wild mushrooms. I like storing them, but I'm also pretty busy and lazy. And so uh, I find myself in a situation where I'm like, okay, a few pounds is definitely enough for me, especially if I'm picking up something like chanterelles. They're really, you know, like hearty mushrooms and you get a lot of mushroom, you know, when you've cooked them per mushroom that you pick in the forest, which uh, some mushrooms, they like lose tons and tons of moisture. And so, you know, chanterelles, it's almost... I mean, I wouldn't say pound for pound, but you're definitely like, if you collect five pounds of chanterelles, you have 3.5 to four pounds of food after you're done preparing them. So that's pretty slick. Uh, so, you know, that's my um, foraging perspective. And then when it comes to things that I want to collect and study. So um, this is a good example of something that I would feel totally comfortable just picking and, uh, you know, picking several of them and bringing them home with me or taking photographs. Like, I just don't worry about... Um, you know, disturbing something that I want to study if I don't know it. So this is a peppery milky cap. Uh, the the scientific name on this, uh, more or less, like within within throwing distance, is Lactifluus peperatus species group. And so it's peppery milky cap. Uh, Lactifluus is a genus that has several different species, some of them quite delicious and edible. But uh, peperatus species group has this very, very, I mean, you can almost not see that these are separate uh, gills, but they sure are. And as with a lot of other milky cat mushrooms, when you damage it, it produces a lot of uh, latex, which is just, you know, this uh, juicy milk, in this case, kind of whitish, that bleeds from the gills. And it's called the peppery milky cat because this whitish uh, juice, which will start to turn a yellowy color, is really supremely hot. And I don't mean hot like, um, you know, a pleasant cayenne pepper. I mean very, very very uh, burn your face hot. And so, uh, you know, this is definitely not a mushroom I would collect to eat, but I'm very comfortable collecting it um, to study. And so, uh, you know, I encourage you to do the same. I think it's really important to note that like, if you find a mushroom uh, that you don't know, maybe don't pick a massive patch of them. Like usually six to seven fruiting bodies of different ages, including the whole fruiting body will suffice. I'll give you a good example here, actually, which is my collection of Cantharellus velutinus, maybe, um, which is inclusive of numerous fruiting bodies collected in the same general vicinity, uh, including, you know, young ones. And uh, so that's something that, you know, if I'm just collecting for the table, I typically would leave the little guys alone. But if I want to really uh, get a robust collection of uh, a species, I will gather, you know, numerous ones of them and not worry about, you know, the, uh, the health of the mycelium, because ultimately at that scale for identification or, you know, personal consumption purposes, the uh, possible harm to the mycelium is trivial to nil to maybe potentially positive, but I'm not going to go there. There's a whole lot of research about, you know, responsible mushroom harvesting. When it comes to legal mushroom harvesting, let's go there. So national forests are typically a really good place uh, to hunt for wild mushrooms. The uh, Pisgah National Forest, which is one of the largest and most um, you know, popular national forests in North Carolina, allows uh, individuals to pick up to five pounds uh, on a trip to the forest without a permit. So you just basically have to be like, I'm going to consume these and that's, that's my deal. Um, and so, you know, there are other places in other states where there are mushroom permits that you have to get, or even like, gosh, uh, free mushroom permits. So you just basically have to be like, I intend to collect mushrooms. And that's the area that is like, when it comes to, um, you know, forest products and foraging, mushrooms oftentimes fall into this like kind of weird gray area between hunting regulations and, um, you know, other uh, things related to plants. And so like often, you know, you're not allowed to go and cut down trees. And so a lot of times I'm like, okay, if it's mushrooms, I tend to assume it's going to be more strict than it typically is. But anyway, National Forest, really a good place to start. And we have several of them in North Carolina and I don't think any of them require permits. National Parks, by way of contrast, 
are uh, in general a very serious no-fly zone for collecting mushrooms. And uh, so those are, you know, highly preserved spaces and it's very important to uh, respect the rules. And you can get very big tickets, etc. So that is um, something I would not recommend. An exception to that is the Great Smoky Mountains National Forest uh, on the uh, state line of sort of North Carolina and Tennessee. And there you are allowed to collect mushrooms for personal consumption up to one pound. And the thing that's really important to note, and this makes perfect sense if you're a like park manager and you're trying to preserve the forest, but also allow people a little leeway to collect fun stuff, is you can collect mushrooms from the ground, but not from trees, even, you know, decomposing or sick trees. And the whole idea of that, you know, in the same vein, uh, you know, they have a lot of very strict rules about dispersed camping and not, you know, harnessing um, your camping equipment or your hammock to trees. And so that's the perspective there. But, you know, Smoky Mar Mountains National Park is a wonderful place to go and observe fungi. I spent uh, a couple of days there last week and it just blew my socks off. Like you get to go up, th you know, 3000 feet in elevation and because the Appalachian Mountains are so ancient, like some of the most ancient habitats on Earth, there's a tremendous amount of genetic and morphological diversity between mushrooms that grow at the base of the mountain and mushrooms that grow at the top of the mountain. And so it was um, a phenomenal trip. I uh, honestly, you know, with it being a mountainous uh, area, it really remanded to me taking photographs, which is more and more like I love to collect uh, chanterelle mushrooms and I'll probably make a pizza with these guys because they're just so gorgeous and glorious. Uh, but, you know, by the same token, that trip was a great example of me just taking a lot of photos and saying, I have a long way to walk. I don't want to carry all these mushrooms with me. Uh, but that's also, you know, that's a digression into why I'm like, I like to eat mushrooms. I like to take pictures of mushrooms even more. And that was like a whole new chapter in my uh, mushroom hunting sort of history. So I encourage you to get into that if you want. All right, so uh, we uh, talked about national forests and the national parks. State parks in North Carolina, very strict. No mushroom hunting. You will get a ticket, and they are serious. If they see you with a basket uh, in, at one of the you know, state parks around Raleigh, the rangers are really, really nice people, but they will um, almost immediately be like, you are here uh, to take the squirrels food and we are not having it. So just don't bother with that. You will, um, you, you know, I mean, it, it frustrates me to be to be perfectly honest, I'm going to tell you a quick story. So I went to a state park for one of the first times in many, many months, uh, about two months ago. And the reason I don't go to state parks is because I'm not allowed to pick mushrooms. And again, it's not like I necessarily want to take things home with me to eat, but like I want to be able to interact with these organisms. And it's just not allowed in state parks. And I don't want to make trouble for those people. That's great that they maintain those spaces. But um, I went out uh, to one and took a walk and I found this really little, uh, one of my friends, uh, not me, I was there. I found a mushroom that was really great, by which I mean my friend Murray Soul found it. And I said, oh, it's a really unassuming little cup looking fungus. It's kind of similar to the peanut butter cup fungus, which is very, very common as well. And it's sort of this wiggly, jiggly brown and uh, tan thing. But this one was sort of a little more quirky, a little bit more like um, a, uh, an acorn. Uh, and then it had this yellowy sort of, uh, you know, rubbery undersurface. And so it wasn't, it was kind of plain, but I'm like, okay, we're in a state forest or in a state park. I just can't collect this. So I took it apart and I took a couple of pictures, but because it was kind of like, not, not mundane. I'd never seen anything quite like it before, but I wasn't really honed in on, you know, it being something special. And so I took pictures and I went home and I'm like, oh, those kind of came out pretty neat. And I also, uh, with a friend, came up with a, you know, provisional identification of Wolfina orontiopsis. Say that one more time, Wolfina orontiopsis. Um, and I posted it to the internet and turns out this is a very rare uh, mushroom that some people in the southeast are trying to document, you know, where it's been found, etc. and so on. So I logged my observations on iNaturalist like a good kid and <laughs> under some pressure, to be frank, 
If you're not familiar, iNaturalist is a wonderful community and a wonderful resource for observations of uh, wild organisms of all kinds, but it also, uh, logging observations is something that I can often be terrible at doing. But I uploaded my pictures of Wolfina orientiopsis, and I felt kind of badly that I wasn't able to take the specimen home and take it apart because I'd only taken a couple of pretty superficial pictures. All that by way of saying, I would love it if state parks were a little, uh, like they had the leeway to say, okay, we will allow scientific observation and collecting and, and uh, mushroom bothering. Um, but you know, be that as it may, state parks is just not where you wanna go. As far as where I go, I spend most of my time in Wildlife Resources Commission land. And so this is uh, game lands. Uh, and, you know, honestly, I'm outside of the city of Raleigh. I'm near um, a reservoir. And so even though this is a place where people can do duck hunting, there's a lot of people doing fishing and canoeing, all those recreational activities. Um, it's pretty park-like. However, it is managed by the Wildlife Resources Management Commission. And so you're able to do a variety of activities with and without permits. And mushroom gathering is one of those things that it's like, okay, you can go ahead and do some of that. And again, all of this is at a small scale, and I'm not going to speak to um, you know the ways that you can collect commercially or uh, sell commercially there's a lot of really great resources out there if you're interested in doing those things but I'm not an expert so I'm not gonna not going to be that person um, I'm going to be a person who drinks water and then talk about chanterelles in a way that I hope is not too pedantic all right nope not quite That ought to do it. Before I do that, let's see. You can start to see with this uh, milky cap. Oh, it's not quite as visible, but you can start to see that this, uh, you know, latex, this juice has started to streak a little bit yellow. And as time goes on, that's going to continue to intensify. But, ooh, and I just touched my nose. I really hope I didn't have any of that latex on it. That, that I mean, it is a zinger, uh, those peppery milky caps. All right, so let's talk about our chanterelles. Uh, one of the, I've been holding this one for quite some time, so I'll show you a different one. Um, so cantharellus uh, is a genus that has a whole bunch of different species. And as I mentioned, we have some pretty cryptic stuff. Uh, and um, cantharellus velutinus is a provisional species that is, um, you know, I think it's the mushroom that I find more often than not in my patches. And so I got some help um, in getting some information from Jay Justice, uh, who is a co-author of a marvelous book on Amanitas, and a friend of mine named Kenny Rupert, who is um, a marvelous you know, mushroom educator and uh, man about town and a wizard of knowledge. So anyway, um, you know, the Cantharellus velutinus is um, a, you know, I'm gonna speak about it as though it it is a species and as though it is this specific specimen and I'll explain why. So basically you have a mushroom that looks uh, like a sort of classic chanterelle. One of the things that um, happens with our many of our chanterelle species in North Carolina is that they have a uh, sort of carotenoid or a sort of orangey brownish um, staining that happens to them over time. And I just cut this and you can see it's got sort of a an orangey whitish in you know um, interior and that's that's the flesh inside but we're gonna wait a little while and it'll start to take on sort of an orangey brownish uh, stain and sometimes it's quite alarming you'll collect a whole lot of chanterelle mushrooms and it's not just velutinus this that does this by the way a lot of the southeastern species uh, you know you'll collect them and put them in a bag and you've taken very nice care of them and you open up the fridge the following day and they're like all brown and like rust colored and you wonder what you've done wrong and the answer is you've not done anything wrong. There are just these sort of um, orangey, rusty pigments that happen uh, and, you know, come in when the mushrooms are bruised or aged to one degree or another. So Cantharellus velutinus is one of the species that is described as having this feature, but it's kind of slow uh, to come in. And here is a mushroom I probably picked it 20 minutes ago or so. And as you can see, you've got a little bit of sort of orangey staining going on. Um, some mushrooms and like, uh, 
uh, hydna mushrooms, hedgehogs, and a number of the chanterelles really stain abruptly and very, very uh, robustly orange. And so again, the, the, the speed of the staining always matters to one degree or another. All right, the other features of Cantharellus velutinus uh, that are noteworthy is that you have what's called sort of a pubescent uh, cap surface. And so basically this one, when I collected it, it was a little bit wet, so it almost looked greasy. But as you uh, look even closer, you'll see it has basically these little, uh, you know, kind of fibrous little hairy, a, a bit furry. And actually, uh, velutinus refers to a velvetiness, and that's uh, in reference to this cap surface. Another thing that you will very frequently see is these uh, sort of lobes and interlocking or overlapping uh, caps, and they're very flowery, but uh, Cantharellus velutinus is described as not opening up nearly as dramatically as some uh, chanterelle mushrooms do. So this is one that is uh, pretty mature. As you can see, it also came up like from underneath a, a stick. But as you can see, the, the uh, margin of it is still pretty inrolled, and like, if you're familiar with chanterelles, a lot of them look much more uh, like this when they're mature. So they're really, uh, you know, uplifted. But uh, Velutinus has this sort of, um, you know, slight furriness. Ooh, this one's got some good examples of this. You, you can see the whitish sort of furriness and, uh, and, you know, a variety of different sort of orangey colors. Um, as far as the coloration is concerned, we have a couple of different, um, what are described as uh, the different types of, or, you know, essentially the morphological forms that this mushroom can take. So what it looks like. So uh, your, I think it's called the typical form is um, an orangey yellow color. And so this is uh, something that you would recognize from a lot of different chanterelles. It's sort of egg yolky colored on top and uh, you have uh, forked and veined false gills underneath. And uh, Cantharellus velutinus, unlike some other chanterelles, those uh, you know false gills are much, typically much lighter in color. And so some chanterelles are like orange on top and orange on bottom, but these guys are uh, kind of lighter. One quick note, we also have other golden chanterelles that have very light or white undersurfaces, and that's the ghost chanterelle and the deceptive chanterelle. I've talked about them in other videos as well. But uh, so, you know, you have this uh, tomentose almost, like slightly furry cap, and very um, oftentimes just with these gorgeous sort of lobes and um, ridges, uh, or, you know, it's, it's a very flowery mushroom. I love to encounter it. Uh, and so color wise, this one you can see is more orangey underneath um, and you have uh, really, really clear uh, forked wrinkles in the gills. And so, you know, these are definitely on the orangier side, but you can see probably on the cap here, it's almost got slightly peachy tones to it, ever so slightly. Now, this is probably the typical form of Cantharellus velutinus, which is sort of an orangey thing. Uh, but some of them, and this one is a better example, are far more peachy in color. Let me see. The, I've got the sun coming in. Actually, here's another uh, mushroom tip if you do get into um, taking photographs of mushrooms. So I do like this hat, and I like to wear it because I think it looks cool, and I need something because otherwise, you know, whatever. But it is also very good for shading mushrooms for taking photographs. And so taking a picture of a mushroom in full sun is really a pain in the neck, and you often end up with something that is washed out and you can't tell uh, really what you have going on. So shading uh, a specimen with my hat is a very, very, um, it's just a useful thing to do. And I'm, I'm not hardcore enough to carry around an umbrella. And so uh, it's a good substitute. Anyway, so let's, let's look at this a little bit less in the bright light. So you can see it's orangey, but it also has these peachy tones to it. Now there's another species called Cantharellus persicanus, and it's really difficult to tell the difference between this sort of peachy Cantharellus velutinus 
and Cantharellus persicanus. Here is another specimen uh, that is, you can see, really quite peachy. And because it's orange as well, you have this peach orange situation with what I would think of as Cantharellus velutinus. The specimens I found of Cantharellus persicanus that, you know, folks have said, yeah, that, that tracks, that looks like the right ID, are far more like really peachy pink and also very diminutive. And this one, you know, kind of falls in between of like, okay, it's more on the peachy side and it is quite little, but because it was growing with all of these other dudes that I would definitely consider to be, you know, Cantharellus velutinus, either a peachy sort of variant or the uh, typical variant, which is just sort of orangey and lightish colored underneath, then I'm going to just, um, you know, lump this little fella in with the rest of them. And again, all chanterelles are edible. Actually, velutinus, another thing uh, that I love about them is that uh, a lot of times chanterelle mushrooms get very, very buggy on the inside. And um, these mushrooms have a lot more, in my experience, denser flesh. It's kind of, you can see it has slightly orangey tones, but it's mostly white on the inside. But they seem to be more bug resistant. And so, you know, I have a little more time for them to mature before I collect them. And let's open this one up and take a look at the inside. So you can see it's really just squeaky clean on the inside. And there's so many chanterelle mushrooms that are like full of maggots and maggot poop. And I'm just not willing to eat a tremendous amount of maggots or maggot poop. So anyway, uh, Cantharellus velutinus, really, really beautiful. And uh, I guess as I understand it, it may be uh, related to Cantharellus lateritis and Cantharellus, oh, maybe it's pronounced lateritious. Um, anyway, oh God, <laughs> the tree is starting to shed leaves. It's like, shut the fuck up, it's time for you to go home. Uh, anyway, I do want to share with you a couple of the smaller specimens here. So, you know, they really are beautiful little mushrooms and uh, they come up as mycorrhizal species, meaning year after year they will, you know, grow in your, um, your beech groves and with oak trees as well. So uh, it's, it's just a wonderful experience every year. I've been visiting this particular place now for 10 seasons and uh, the mushrooms have only become more abundant or I have become better at noticing them. Uh, in conclusion, I'm going to show you a teeny tiny little chanterelle. Um, so this is Cantharellus cinnabarinus. And so, you know, most chanterelles are that like kind of clunky, uh, orangey things I was just showing you. But, uh, there is a, I think it's a subgenus called cinnabarinus. That's basically a totally different type of critter as far as its size. Uh, and so they're, and their coloration. So they're sort of this vermilion color or cinnabar, uh, cinnabar red is sort of the, that's what that, um, you know, what it resembles. And so, uh, that subgenus contains, oh gosh, Cantharellus texensis, so the Texan cinnabar chanterelle or red chanterelle. And um, also, I very recently learned about Cantharellus corallinus. And uh, again, very similar looking, but basically you just have a dainty little chanterelle, but it still has those really nice uh, sort of sinuous um, little uh, forked false gills. And, uh, you know, unlike most chanterelles is sort of, um, got not much in the middle, like it's a little bit light and a little bit, uh, becomes the color of the outside of the stem. Uh, but they are edible and they're colorful. And so, you know, sometimes they are, they're nice as a you know, garnish or what have you, um, you know, full disclosure, not disclosure, but just like, if you're not familiar with uh, the best ways to eat wild mushrooms, almost always the answer is cook thoroughly and then. So that's inclusive of all of these mushrooms, including these like little guys. And I say that once, I went on a walk one time and I mentioned to some folks like these are edible mushrooms and this adorable young woman was like terrific and just like ate three or four of them. And she was totally fine. But at the same time, I was like, no, I when I say edible, I uh, mean, edible after being thoroughly cleaned and cooked. All right, so I think that is everything I have to share with you today. Let's see how yellow this has turned. Um, pretty, pretty faint in the way of yellow, but it's definitely, um, you know, the, I almost did it again, almost touched my nose. Better not do that. Uh, but, you know, 
Cantharellus velutinus and Cantharellus persicinus and Cantharellus phasmatus and Cantharellus tenuthrix and Cantharellus formosus. Like there are a lot of different species of these mushrooms that grow absolutely everywhere. And um, you know, the smooth chanterelles of these uh, velutinus are related to, um, which is Cantharellus uh, Lateritius or Cantharellus uh, Flavo Lateritius. I'm just, just doing all the names because I'm trying to encode them, not because I know them. Uh, anyway, so like these dudes uh, live genetically, at least we think, close to smooth chanterelles, which are very cool, and I saw a lot of them in the mountains. But all of that by way of saying there's just a, such an abundance of diversity, even within one of the most popular and well-known groups of edible mushrooms that is kind of a uh, wonderful place to get started. And, uh, you know, mycology is very challenging. Um, just like on the subject of learning about this, I uh, had uh, one person mention, and I think it was Kenny uh, Rupert, who is a wonderful, wonderful person. So I'd, I'd shared one of these little sort of reddish things, and he said, they could be Cantharellus, uh, uh, Cantharellus corallinus. And I'm like, I have never heard of this. And then shortly thereafter, I posted another thing and someone was like, it could be this different thing. And I'm like, I'd never heard of that chanterelle before. And I almost was affronted of like, this must be new chanterelle knowledge. And Kenny and uh, Jay Justice uh, separately, you know, sent me references to a couple of papers to read up on Cantharellus velutinus and the different kinds of cinnabar, little red chanterelles and smooth chanterelles. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to dig into this new research. And I open the papers and it's like 2016. Okay, so it is not new knowledge. It is new to me knowledge. And that is one of the most, <laughs> it's humbling to to not recognize mushrooms. It's humbling to occasionally be like, I consider myself to be well read. And so, uh, you know, I must be caught up and then find out that in fact you are seven or eight years late to the party. Um, this happens all the time. And you know, I, if I had to rate myself on a scale of one to 10 on mushroom identification, I give myself a solid three in the habitats I am very familiar with. Like get me in Montana and I drop to a 0 0.6 real fast, I tell you. However, even if you know how to identify five wild mushrooms, you're still like exponentially better at mushroom identification than most of your friends if you live in, you know, if you live in the United States and certainly if you live in the southeastern US, which is in a lot of ways a pity, you know, so um, go visit your uh, Wildlife Resources Commission lands and responsibly harvest. Go see the wonderful National Forest. Document what you find. Upload it to iNaturalist. Don't be like me. And more to the point, just have a great time because mushrooms, like I feel often quite bad for people who are like, I will only be satisfied when I have climbed Kilimanjaro. And that is the definition of an adventure for me. And for me, I'm like, I'm so much more pedestrian. And as soon as I start to look at things more closely, I can really just um, feel a sense of awe that is very satisfying to me, even though these are very small things, they don't run away from me. Like there's a lot of reasons in which mushroom hunting, like I really get it when people go out with me and they're not into the mushroom thing. And they're like, oh God, we gotta pay the mushroom tax. Cause I'm just like, absorbed by these organisms and because I know a little bit about them, noticing different things about them and their characteristics becomes this very uh, rewarding and awe-inspiring experience. But I get it. It can be super boring if you're not into wild mushrooms to spend time with us. So anyway, if I have ever bored you uh, now or in times past, my apologies. Find a billion mushrooms. Let's talk again soon.